This is Wayne Dyer, and I'm here to talk to you for the next uh, 90 minutes or so about a book that uh, I wrote back in the 1970s, in 1975, in fact. It was first published in 1976. It's called Your Erroneous Owns. A lot of people mistook that title. They took it home in brown paper bags all across America, thinking they were getting uh, a sex book, but it is nothing like that. These are far more ticklish zones than uh, those. This is uh, a book that skyrocketed to the top of the bestseller list and stayed there for a couple of years. It is uh, a book that turned my life around in many, many ways, many, many positive ways. Uh, at the time, I was teaching at a university at St. John's University in New York when I wrote this book. I subsequently left that position and uh, have written many books since that time and uh, also have produced a lot of uh, audio tapes and have become a, a lecturer and uh, many, many changes have taken place. So many, many years after the uh, publication of this book, I've been asked to do an audio tape about uh, your erroneous owns. It's an exciting prospect for me to go back into this book that uh, has been so impactful in my life and in the lives of uh, estimated around the world. Some 30 million copies of this book have been sold in uh, all of the different foreign editions in the uh, United States also. And... Uh, the way to uh, take a look at this book and look at the uh, concepts that uh, I was writing about back then is to understand the concept of uh, what erroneous zones means. Your erroneous zones is a uh, is obviously a uh, the key word in there is erroneous, and the word erroneous means error. And this is a book about the errors that people make in their lives as they go through their life and try to manage their own emotions. I think I've had more comments to me. Uh, since this book was published, about the one thing that seemed to be the most important to them as they read this book was that they learned that they had control over their own emotions. In writing this book and sitting down to write Erroneous Owns and talking about these concepts today, uh, I think the most important thing that you can get out of this is to understand that you are a choice-making individual and that all of the conditions that you find yourself in your life, all of the circumstances of your life, all of the emotional reactions that you have uh, to all of the people and all of the things and events and so on that take place in your life are really uh, choices. And that's a very difficult thing for a lot of people to get because they're raised to believe that uh, I can't help the way I feel. Uh, I have a right to be miserable when somebody treats me in a certain way. I can't help it. I've always been that way. It's just my nature. It's just the kind of person that I am. Uh, people use things like it's, uh, I'm Italian or I'm, uh, I'm from New York or uh, uh, I, I just uh, grew up in a family that always talked to each other like this and I can't help myself. And these are the kinds of things that uh, I really wanted to attack uh, and eradicate from uh, your thinking. That is that you can't help the way that you are. You indeed are the product of all of the choices that you've made up until this moment. And if you do not like what your life is about. I'm always reminded of James Allen in uh, As a Man Thinketh. He said that uh, circumstances do not make a man. They reveal him. And the circumstances of your life truly reveal what kinds of choices that you have made up until now. Which means that in order to rid yourself of erroneous owns or get past the negativity and the doubt and the judgment and the the kinds of emotional reactions that uh, get in your way, you have to put responsibility first and foremost on yourself. You have to rid yourself of the uh, inclination to blame other people for what is wrong with you, to blame your circumstances, to look backwards in your life and look at your uh, family and, and come up with all kinds of uh, real nice explanations, but they really don't uh, help you to... Uh, get past these kinds of emotional reactions. So the way I want to go through this on the tape is to um, kind of uh, wind my way through what I think of as the erroneous zones. The first major erroneous zones is uh, what I call self-doubt. Again, erroneous meaning error, the kind of ways that you process your life. You have one life to live. You have two parts to that life. One part of that life is your uh, physiology, the physical body that you've shown up in, that you find yourself trapped in, that you can never escape while you're, uh, while you're here. And you take it with you wherever you go. You can't leave the office in the morning and uh, go home with a different body. You carry it around with you everywhere you go. 
And then there's the invisible part of you, the part of you that processes everything that you experience in your life. This is your mind, your consciousness, your soul, or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter what you label it. It's just understanding that, uh, that how you process and, and perceive yourself is determined not by what other people tell you as much as you'd like to believe that, but in fact by how you have chosen to process yourself. And what you want to learn how to do right off the bat, at the very beginning, is to understand that disliking yourself or experiencing self-rejection or uh, putting yourself down or finding fault with yourself or looking at your body and telling yourself all the things about it that you don't like. Like you may be too tall, you might tell yourself that you're too short, you might tell yourself that you're too heavy, that you're too light, that you're any number of things, and you can go through every organ in your body. And some people do this very thing and find all kinds of reasons why they don't like this, they don't like that, they don't like the size of their, their legs, they don't like the size of their breasts, they don't like the way their hair is, they don't like their eyes, they don't like their ears, their nose is too big. They're, it's an endless. And this is like uh, a burden that you place on yourself in your life. And it's something that you want to really begin to process in a different way. And a way to process it is to say, uh, what do I get out of this? What's the, what's the point in me disliking myself or finding fault with myself? It's the only self I have. Instead of doing that and uh, keeping myself miserable, what I'm going to do is uh, look in the mirror and say to myself, this is the body that I have shown up in for whatever reason, whether it was my plan, or whether it was God's plan, whether it was my parents' plan, whether it was a conspiracy, whatever, it is still the reality. And I am going to accept the reality of what I have shown up in and see it as my curriculum to a higher place. The body that you're in, whether it's in a wheelchair, whether it's blind, whether it's deaf, whether it's tall, whether it's short or black, white, whatever it may be, it is still your curriculum. It's what you have to use to get to the highest place that you want to be in your life. So rejecting it is really rejecting your entire life curriculum. Uh, and you have to really look at the, the whole idea of, in our culture, it's almost... I think I have been asked the question on talk shows across America more about this particular subject than anything else. And the question is, isn't it selfish? Aren't you promoting selfishness? Aren't you telling people that uh, they should love themselves and reject all other people and so on. And I'd like to put that to rest right here. The first thing you have to ask yourself is what does it mean to be selfish? To be selfish is to be a burden to another human being. Whenever you find yourself a burden to somebody else or someone else is a burden to you, that is a very selfish act. The person who dislikes himself, believe it or not, is the biggest burden to be around in the world. This is someone who is never happy, doesn't know how to make themselves happy, is using other people to uh, try to get them to be happy, is always blaming other people for uh, the, the, the conditions of their life. Uh, the person who has self-doubt or self-rejection uh, uh, doesn't know how to enjoy their life. And being around a person who doesn't enjoy their life is burdensome. The person who does love themselves, who feels good about themselves, who, if you ask the question, do you love yourself, there's not even an issue there. There's not even a question involved. It's simply, of course I do. This is, this is me. This is all I have. Of course I love myself. Why wouldn't I? Why would I ever put myself down? It has nothing to do with uh, being conceited or finding fault with other people or uh, uh, making yourself better than anybody else. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the simple notion that in order for me to be happy, I have to love myself. In order to be able to uh, be free from being a burden to somebody else, I have to know how to enjoy my life. If I know how to enjoy my life, it means that I am loving the life that I'm having, and that means I'm loving the body that I'm in, I'm loving the self that I am. And therefore, you will not be a burden to anybody else. The person who loves themselves is never a burden to anyone else unless it's conceit. And conceit is just another form of trying to get other people to pay more attention to you. But if it's just authentic self-acceptance, then it is, it is the most important thing that you can do. And in raising children, nothing is more important in the whole educational environment than self-concept, self-esteem. This is what we're trying to teach all the time to young people is feel good about yourself. Treat yourself, cherish yourself as a, as a valuable, important, significant 
grand, divine creature, as someone who is unique and special in all the world, and feel that way about yourself wherever you go and carry yourself that way. Because the minute that you start practicing self-rejection, and self-rejection shows its ugly head in a lot of ways, you can reject compliments that are directed at you. Oh, this old thing, I'm really not very smart. I'm just real lucky, I, I guess. I mean, it's, that whole kind of condescending, always putting yourself down. Someone says, gee, you look really nice today. No, no, I don't really look nice. This is, uh, this just, this is just a, a facade. This isn't the real me. Um, you can make up excuses for why you look nice. Uh, it's my hairdresser. She does it for me. Uh, or it's the wardrobe. Or uh, it's the color that I'm wearing. It, it isn't really me. Uh, you can give credit to, uh, to other people uh, all the time and not take credit for yourself. Uh, whenever somebody says something to you, you can, re you can experience self-rejection by saying things like, uh, well, my husband feels this way, or, or my mother always said, in other words, putting the emphasis for your life on other people and other events and other things in your life. Um, you can always be verifying your opinions of for other people. Like if someone says something to you, your, your response can be, well, isn't that right, George? Uh, George, George, tell him that this is what I mean. That's a form of self-rejection. Uh, you might uh, be in a restaurant and uh, refuse to order something that uh, you want because you don't think that you're worth it. So you look for the cheapest thing on the menu. A uh, very typical kind of uh, self-rejecting kind of attitude. Um, you cannot buy yourself something, even though you might have the money, uh, because you don't think that you're worth it. I've seen many times on airplanes where uh, uh, someone will uh, refuse to have a little glass of wine with their meal because they don't feel that they should spend three dollars on themselves. Uh, so they put themselves and they put the three dollars away and don't, and don't feel uh, that that they are important enough to have that. Uh, you can avoid indulgences and, and doing nice things for yourself, because, not because of finances here, but because you just don't feel that uh, it's worth it. It's, you, you certainly shouldn't have flowers around. I mean, you're not, uh, you're not important enough to have flowers. Other people get flowers, but certainly not you. Uh, anyway, these kinds of, uh, of self-rejection attitudes... Uh, start out very young in your life. And, and in fact, you may have been carrying them around for an entire lifetime. It isn't to say that, uh, that they didn't happen to you and, and haven't been going on in your life since you were a little boy or a little girl. But the, the fact is that you have to still understand that life is a choice and that if you want to improve your self-esteem and you want to improve your life, uh, it starts with saying to yourself, I have been buying into this all of my life. As a little boy or a little girl, it wasn't my mother who did it to me. I believed it. I bought into it. I, I was, they tried to convince me that I wasn't that important, and I accepted it. And now I'm an adult, and I am still buying into it. I'm still accepting it, and I'm still carrying over all of this leftover baggage from uh, perhaps other people making this effort. So you have to say to yourself, they didn't do it to me. I allowed it to happen, and I am no longer willing to allow myself to be immobilized by the rejection that other people or other events or other institutions or whatever it may be may have uh, attempted to impose on me. So what you want to do at this point is, is if, you, if you can see that, the, that there are areas of your life in which you are self-rejecting and identify them, and make a commitment to changing them, then you can come up with some specific things that you can do about them. And some of those specifics, those strategies, those techniques that uh, you can use to rid yourself of this uh, self-rejection are, are really, are really quite simple. I mean, you can, uh, you can begin to, to discipline yourself to select new responses to others' attempts uh, at, at making you feel... Um, at making you feel good. When someone says to you, uh, gee, you look really nice today, you can practice instead of that immediate self-rejecting kind of, oh, it really isn't me, or this is my hairdresser, or whatever, you can, you can just, a, a very simple thank you, or it's nice to know that, uh, that you appreciate me. Just, even if you don't mean it. I mean, just sometimes you have to fake it, but faking it is all right, as long as you are practicing a kind of, hey, I'm, you know, if someone says to me I look nice or that I smell good or that I look nice in this outfit or that I look younger than I am or whatever, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm entitled to that. I'm entitled to a compliment. I'm worth that. You can practice saying things like I love you and, 
and check out when someone says that back to you. How do you react to that? What is the, what is your reaction to that? And accept the I love yous and the caresses and the and the affection that other people are directing at you as a, as something that is directed towards someone who deserves that rather than always doubting it and saying, oh, I wonder if he really does that or I wonder if she really means it or if, and, and all of the doubting kind of things. I, I, of course you would love me. Your, your attitude, your inner conversation goes, of course you would love me. I'm, I'm worth being loved. I'm a, valuable, I'm a valuable person. You can practice ordering things that you want in a restaurant. I mean, just, as, just for practice. Uh, instead of looking at the price tag, ask yourself, what, what, what do I feel like having? And, get, and give yourself little rewards. Little rewards are, are things that, uh, that you can practice. And the practice gives you a kind of self-discipline of, of self-acceptance and self-esteem and, and, and value. Um, you indulge yourself with something that's really nice just for you. No one else has to know about it. Why? Because you're worth it. Because you're important. Because you're significant. Uh, you've got to look at things like jealousy. Jealousy is really a put-down of yourself, making another person's opinion of you more important than your opinion of yourself. You want to really watch out for that. If you find yourself extremely jealous of somebody else, you can ask yourself, what does it say about myself? As a matter of fact, you can take every single erroneous zone or every single negative behavior in your life and ask the question, when I'm experiencing this emotionally, what does this say about how I feel about myself? Why would I allow myself to go through this kind of agony this kind of hurt, this kind of pain, and bring it home to uh, I am no longer going to treat myself as a shabby person who isn't entitled to feel good or to feel positive about himself. I'm not going to do that any longer. And when I'm experiencing anger or guilt or worry or fear or any of the kinds of things that uh, I call erroneous zones, you start with why am I allowing myself to be in this state of immobilization. Don't I think I'm valuable enough to be beyond that? You, do, you are entitled to be happy. You are deserving of happiness. And there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. It is a way of living. The next erroneous zone that I want to talk about briefly is uh, something that uh, comes right after self-doubt as the most significant and painful of the emotional immobilizations that come from the way we process our life. Approval seeking. Looking for your value in the approval of others. Making other people's opinions more important than your own opinion of yourself, which is exactly what you do every single time you find yourself upset, immobilized, depressed, uh, out of sorts, even unhappy with the way someone else has treated you or behave towards you, and if you are experiencing an inner kind of discontent as a result of what somebody else has said or done, what you're really saying in that moment is, what that person thinks of me is more important than what I think of myself. And that's the big shift that you want to make. You want to be able to say to yourself, they have an opinion, and their opinion is something that they're very much entitled to. Even their opinion about me is something that they're entitled to. But it doesn't say who I am and it doesn't validate who I am. Who I am is how I choose to process my life. And if there are certain people in it who do not like what I'm doing or who, who find fault with what I'm doing or who disagree with what I'm doing or are or, or, or really even unhappy with what I'm doing, that is normal and in the way of things. One of the... Uh, Great things that you learn when you uh, are involved in uh, in political elections is that uh, a landslide, like in the 1972 election, I believe it was uh, George McGovern against uh, Nixon, and uh, it was considered the greatest political landslide in American history. And a lot of people don't realize that about 47 percent of the people in this country voted for George McGovern for president. In politics, if you get half of the people plus 3% on your side, you got a landslide. So why would you expect everyone that's out there in the world to agree with and, ex- and understand and behave in ways towards you that are commensurate with what you believe about yourself? If you get half the people, plus a couple, in any given day to agree with you and to like you and to approve of you, you've you got a landslide going. You're doing terrific. So when you start 
learning how to eradicate this approval-seeking disease, the first thing that you do is say that I do not expect people to approve of me. I do not expect them to uh, agree with me. Now, you've been raised on approval-seeking. You've been raised by going through your schools uh, to please the teacher. Your parents very early taught you that uh, getting my approval is more important than anything else. Do what you are told. And yet one of the things we've learned is that children who are raised on blind obedience have more higher degrees of prejudice and uh, an inability to make decisions for themselves than any other group. It's obvious. If someone is just told what to think and how to think and what to do and where to go and what their values are and are never allowed to think for themselves, then they're going to, they will prejudge everyone that they're told to prejudge. They'll hate who they're told to hate. And making decisions will be something that will be impossible for them to do. They're the kind of people who go around and when they are, are at a restaurant and they say, well, uh, someone will say to them, well, what kind of food do you like? Oh, I like Italian. And someone sitting next to them say, Italian? Ugh, I hate it. Well, I don't mean I really like Italian. I mean I like Chinese. Chinese? You like that? It's like bait. I can't... Uh, well, I don't really like the Chinese food. I, I really prefer... Uh, and, and it's like their opinion isn't, isn't uh, located within themselves. Their opinion is located in whatever anybody around them is saying. Very much like politicians who are constantly trying to get the approval of everybody for everything that they say. And then and if they're talking to a group over here who, who are, uh, say, pro-guns or whatever, or pro-abortion or whatever, then they will come out and say exactly what, they're, what they think the audience wants them to hear. And then the next day they'll say something else to a different audience. Now, that's, that's one thing in politics, but your life isn't politics. Your life is very personal, and that's what we're talking about here. You do not want to be the kind of person who is always looking at what somebody else is going to say or how they're going to react in order for you to be happy. As a, as a school counselor and as a therapist for years and as a teacher, I used to tell my students who, said, who would say to me, okay, I agree with you, um, but I still want their approval. I would always say to them, look, I want approval too. I mean, I go out in front of an audience, and, uh, and when I finish, they give me a, a standing ovation. I'm really happy. That makes me feel very, very good. I love approval. I want approval. I enjoy approval. But I don't need approval. A need is something that you can't survive without. I need oxygen. I will admit to that. <laughs> And I need uh, sleep, and I need to be held and loved, and I need... Uh, there's a whole lot of needs that I have. Most of them are in the physiological area, and some, many of them are in the psychological as well. But approval is not one of them. Uh, if you need approval, what that means is that you become immobilized without it. Like if someone in this room suddenly started taking the oxygen out of this room, I would become immobilized and die. That's a need. If someone takes the approval out of your life, and you begin to wither then you have got your self-esteem located in the wrong place. Self-esteem means self, located in the self, not located in others. Otherwise, we'd call it others' esteem or something like that. Now, you need to take a look at the people who get the most approval. Because I used to tell my students, this, I'd give them this little talk about approval-seeking and that uh, you don't want to allow other people's opinions to be more important than yourself. And, and uh, you, shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't be surprised at all when you run into disapproval. I'm never surprised at it. It's really interesting because, and, and that's a maturity that I think I've, uh, I've experienced over the years. I used to get letters from people, and if it was a negative letter, I would, it would bother me, and I would think about it, and I would respond to it, and I would try to defend myself. And if I got a bad review of all the books, I've written many, many books and produced a lot of things, and I've spoken on uh, a lot of places, and, and sometimes the review is uh, great. As a matter of fact, when one of my books came out, uh, uh, I was in San Francisco, and the, the editor there took it apart and just tore it apart, did a whole uh, half a page on how terrible this book was the same day in Cincinnati in the, in the, in the Inquirer. Uh, on the opposite side of the, uh, of the uh, country was a review saying what a terrific, great book this was. And you know, which one am I going to respond to? Which one do I choose? When someone sends me a really negative letter about something that I've done, I usually send them back three or four positive letters, and then I'll send them theirs. I'll say, now, if you were me, which one would you pay attention to? And what I've learned is that I've gotten to a point now where the negativity is just something that I expect. 
I'm not, I'm not at all surprised by it. I know when I speak to an audience of several thousand people that there's going to be some who are not going to agree with and like what I'm saying, very much like what I'm saying right here in this tape right now. There will be people who will listen to this and they will find fault with it, and that's fine. And what I tell them is go out and produce your own tape and go out and, and market it and sell it and see how you do with it. That's fine. There's room. This is a free world, and you've got the opportunity to do that very thing. What I don't do any longer with even the negative reviews is get myself immobilized or depressed by it. I, am, I accept that I am going to run into disapproval on a regular part of my life, and I've accepted that the people who love me the most are going to give me the most disapproval. Your parents, your brothers and sisters, your husband, your wife, your siblings, uh, which is the same as your uh, brothers and sisters, isn't it? <laughs> uh, your co work people who care about you are going to sometimes disapprove and sometimes they're not going to disapprove. My wife and I don't agree on uh, about 50% of the things that we do in our lives. She has a certain way of running things. I have a certain way of running things. But I don't let her disapproval immobilize me, and she doesn't let my disapproval immobilize her. We've gotten to the point where we understand that we are different, that she's unique and that I'm unique, and that we're entitled to that. And instead of making that a, a, a place of contention, we've gotten to a point in our lives where conflict and confrontation are not things that we want for ourselves any longer, that we don't want to have that experience on a regular basis of always being upset uh, and angry and hurt over all of the kinds of little things that uh, tend to really ruin relationships. So rather than have that conflict and that confrontation and that pain and the anguish and, and all of that that goes with that, what you do is you shift that and you say, you know, you don't agree with me and I understand that. And that's fine. And I don't, and if I don't need to have her agree with me, if I don't need her approval, if I want it but I don't get it, that's fine. But if I need it, and don't get it, then I'm going to get angry and I'm going to blow up and I'm going to have this problem. So it's like I, I, instead of ex expecting approval for everything that I say and do everywhere in the world, including with my children and with my brothers and sisters and all of the people in my life, instead of that, I expect some disapproval. As a matter of fact, I expect it about half of the time. And when I get it, I'm not surprised. And when I'm not surprised, I, I don't get myself worked up. When I don't get worked up, I have become emotionally mature then. I have been able to handle the, uh, the kinds of things that, uh, that come my way in the area of disapproval. And you're going to run into it a lot in your life. And one of the things that you might do is tell yourself over and over and over again, well, I was, I've always been this way. I, I, was, I grew up on needing approval. And, uh, and as a little boy or a little girl, I was always this way, and I'm still that way today. And that's something you want to eradicate from your life and begin to say, and, and understand that this is not something that is imposed upon you. It is not natural. It's not human nature to be an approval seeker. It is, only, it is not only human. It is only neurotic to be doing that. And you have the choice always, I will say, over and over and over again as you listen to this tape. You have the choice. When someone says something to you that you dislike, when someone behaves in a way towards you that you find offensive, you have the choice in how you're going to process that. You are a processor of life. You must not turn the controls of your life over to somebody else in the form of approval seeking and telling yourself that you have to have it. Now remind yourself, being approved of is wonderful. We all like it. It's terrific. Applause is great. But... It is not something I need, and I expect the opposite quite often. And when I do expect it, then I'm not surprised by it. And I'm not looking for any landslide. And even if I want a landslide, I'm still only going to get 53 or 54% of the people to approve of me. And the other 47 or 46% are not going to. And that is just the way things are. And the person who is free from erroneous zones is someone who knows how to accept things as they are. The next, what I call erroneous zone, or uh, error in thinking or in processing your life, is uh, being attached to the past. You must learn how to free yourself from the past. Now, I'm not saying that you should ignore all your traditions and you should ignore your past. I'm saying that being trapped by it today 
on what you think is something that you had to have in the past and no longer works for you is something that you can get rid of. Again, this is a, a way of processing. This is a way of thinking. It is thought that we're working on here. It isn't uh, a list of, uh, of techniques to go out and practice, practice, practice doing these things. It is new ways of thinking, new ways of processing, because your life is really how you think about it. As you think, so shall you be, are the most important words, I think, in, uh, ever written. In the seven simple words, as you think, so shall you be. Your thoughts are what create your life. One of the traps that really uh, immobilizes people is the, what I call the I'ms, uh, attaching themselves to the past with these self-definitions, these, uh, these labels that we place on ourselves, and we begin to believe the label. The great Danish theologian uh, Soren Kierkegaard once said that uh, once you label me, you negate me. And you have to remember that, uh, that a label is always something once removed from the actual process. Like you can't drink the word water. Uh, and you can't get wet from the, the formula H2O. And there's 1,110 different names for water on our planet. Some call it aqua. Some call it op. In Farsi, it's called op. And then uh, there's uh, Vassar, and you name it, in, uh, in 1,110 different dialects and uh, so on. There's all these words. And yet uh, that label is not what it is. The only way you can know water is to experience it, to get in it, to drink it, to be uh, involved in it, and there's the experience of it. And the same thing is true with these I'ms. When you put a label on yourself like, um, I'm no good at math, or I'm lousy at spelling, or I'm, uh, you know, I'm deficient at, uh, at languages or whatever, you've just put, you know, I'm a, I'm a slow learner. You've put a uh, label on yourself. Now, that isn't who you are. Who you are is how you think. What you think about is what expands in the world. And you are what you think about all day long. It is your thoughts that create your very life. And all of these, these definitions that you place on yourself are just things that keep you from being able to go out and do something about improving the quality of your life. Like if you put a, I call it the I'm circle. If you say something like, I'm shy. I've always been that way. That's my nature. It's just the kind of person I am. I can't help it. I've always been that way. And you hear these sentences over and over and over again. If you believe that, if that becomes who you are, if that label becomes your reality, then you're acting on that pro the way of processing who you are. And if you say to yourself, I'm shy, and then you see yourself at a gathering, a social gathering, and you see a group of attractive people, then you'd like to go over and talk to them. And you say, I think I'll go over and talk to those people. You say, and then you start over there, and you're on your way over, and then you say, oh, wait, I can't do that. Why not? Well, because I'm shy. And there you go into this trap. You get yourself into this uh, circle of uh, neurosis in which you can never escape because you are living by the label. As soon as you put the label on yourself, you are no longer willing to do what it takes to overcome this thing that you have imposed upon yourself. You're not born with shy genes. You're not, it isn't something that uh, anybody uh, imposes on you or injects you with. Uh, uh, it is a choice. You may not know any other choice, but it is still something that you have elected to do. And until you rid yourself of the label that you may have been carrying around all of your life, and then we begin to practice new ways of being. And what you do is instead of saying, I'm shy, you say, up until this moment, I've always elected shy behaviors. But today, in this moment, I am going to elect a non-shy behavior. I'm going to try something different. I'm not going to live by the label that I've imposed on myself. And these labels can include things like uh, uh, I'm not good at sports, I'm clumsy, I, I've never been able to do things. And, and you see people who say I'm clumsy or I'm not good at sports, and then you say to them, well, come on, let's go out and shoot some baskets. They say, oh, that'd be great. And then uh, halfway out they say, oh, no, I can't do that. And I'm, well, why not? Well, I'm just no good at that sort of thing. And as if you get good at that by putting a label on yourself and then sitting on the couch and uh, becoming a couch potato. You get good at anything by ridding yourself first of the label and processing yourself in a new way. And that new way is to say, I can do anything. I can become anything I want. I have always believed that about myself in my life. I've always, a lot of people say, well, if you're a writer, you can't be a good speaker because you know, uh, a writer is someone who is much more introverted and they keep all their things within them and a speaker is much more extroverted, and those two don't mesh. But I believe you can, be, you can excel in, in, in those areas. I believe you can be a poet, and you can also be an athlete. 
Uh, and you can be very, very good at athletics and enjoy that as a very much a part of your life. And you can also be very gentle and you can uh, enjoy flowers and, and you can enjoy little children and you can also enjoy a boxing match and you can uh, enjoy sweating and you can enjoy putting on a tuxedo. Your life can be whatever you choose it, but you first have to rid yourself of these self-defeating I'ms. I'm shy. I'm clumsy. I'm unattractive. I'm ugly. I'm big-boned. I love that one. Uh, I'm, I'm not organized. You know, people just say, they say things like this as if this is why their life is, uh, is in disarray. I'm just disorganized, like, like they inherited disorganized genes. Their genes are all over the place, their, their genetics. You know, there's some in the living room, some in the bedroom, some are in California, some are in Florida, some are in Germany, and they're just all disorganized. And I just, I'm a disorganized person, as if that isn't a choice. To be disorganized is to say, I make disorganized choices. And you're listening to someone who does that. But and, and every now and then I'll say to myself, well, I just don't like all of these details and I hate keeping receipts and I don't like, I resent the IRS for making me keep all of these things and I'm, that's just not the kind of person I am. And then I get a hold of myself and I remind myself, I have chosen to be disorganized. And if I don't want to pay additional taxes, if, I mean, if I don't want to keep receipts, that's fine. I can just give them all of my money and that's no problem. Or I can make the choice to... And so what I did with that, uh, instead of telling myself constantly that I'm disorganized and resenting it, one day I just decided that I would handle my receipt problem like this. And I took 12 boxes and I put them in my office and on the floor and I just labeled them. Postage, printing, utilities, uh, travel, uh, the 12 or 13 categories or whatever it is. And every time I get a receipt, instead of sticking it in something that uh, then at the end of the year resenting having to go through it and all that, I just throw it in one of those little boxes. And then I hired somebody to go through those little boxes and put it all together and take care of it for me. So I still don't have to fool myself into believing that this is something that I enjoy doing. Isn't this terrific? I just simply say, in order to be as happy and effective as I can be, this is a solution. This is a way of dealing with that. And you get people saying things like, I'm forgetful. I can never remember anybody's name. It's just uh, I inter- somebody introduces me to someone and then I've forgotten their name in the next moment. Well, that's a choice. That isn't something that, uh, that happens because you've got some kind of deficiency in your brain or in your memory. It's because you have not paid attention to that kind of thing. And instead of putting a label on yourself of I'm forgetful and that gets in my way, if it does get in your way and you don't like it about yourself, what you want to do is shift that, transfer that to... I am going to change that about myself. Then today, the, the first three people that I'm introduced to, I'm going to repeat their name over and over again in my mind, and I'm going to come up with some kind of an image in my mind so that I will not forget this person's name. And lo and behold, you have shifted an I'm from I'm forgetful to I'm really good at remembering. And you now have a whole new way of processing your life. I love the ones that are things like I'm Italian or I'm German or I'm Irish or I'm black or I'm Chinese. And... Therefore, and whatever the stereotypes that go with these various labels that you put on yourself, these are the things that this is just these are just the things that I do. I mean, I have a short temper, or I'm very uh, uh, sloppy, or I'm uh, uh, very meticulous, or uh, whatever it is, whatever. It, and and you see, you hear people saying things like this. I was in a restaurant one time, and the, the waiter was screaming and hollering and carrying on, and and I called him over to him and I said. Uh, what are you doing? You're getting yourself all worked up. Your blood pressure's going up. You're getting your, you're going to have your, you're going to have a heart attack before you're 50. And he said, guess what? He said, I'm 51 and I had a heart attack two years ago and I'm recovering from it. I said, well, what do you do that for? What do you allow yourself to get so upset for? He said, what do you expect from me? I'm Italian. As if being Italian explained, then he walked away as if that was an explanation for all of that. Like, uh, he, he couldn't do anything about that. Everybody in my family is like that. We're all very this, the way, and that. Well, you can be any way that you want to be. That's the most important thing that you can learn from this tape and from reading erroneous sounds. And that is that you can choose the kind of personality you are going to have. It is not something you're stuck with. It's not something that you just have to have, even though you may have never elected anything to the contrary. You can go out. My wife went out and decided that she was going to get good at something athletic, and she had never done any, anything ath- very much athletic before in her life. And she took up bowling, and she went out, and, and you should see her now. She's unbelievable. And, and a year ago, she couldn't even lift the ball. She didn't even know where to put her fingers, and she's putting her thumb in the finger hole and uh, throwing it the wrong way and dropping. And now she goes out there, and, and, and she's unbelievable. She made the choice. She got rid of the uh, self-definition, 
I'm not good at athletics. And I've seen people do this in many, many areas of their life. Uh, I've he heard people say over and over again, I'm no good at drawing, I'm not artistic, or I'm not musical. And then they stay away from that for their entire life. And that's what I'm saying. You have to break free from the attachment to the past. You may have been in a music class, as I was. I was in the, th in the uh, sixth grade, and uh, we had a, my music teacher's name was Mrs. Sliman. I still remember it. <laughs> and uh, the whole class had to sing, and she said to me, Wayne, when we get to the part where everybody sings, you just mouth the words because we don't want to hear your voice. It's that bad. And since that time, I mean, that was in the sixth grade, uh, we're talking 40 years ago, <laughs> I'm still hanging on in some ways to that belief that I'm not very musical. And the way that I've challenged that in recent years is when I'll be speaking in front of thousands of people, I will break out into song. I will sing to them. I was on the Dinah Shore show, and she asked me, I, I told her that story, and she asked me, she said, come on out and sing. And I went out and sang this row, row, row your boat. And she's, when I finished the whole thing, she said, Wayne, you are the most positive person I've ever met. And you positively cannot sing. <laughs> but it didn't matter. The fact is that it wasn't, I wasn't looking for anybody else's approval, any of that. What I'm saying to you is that if you hang on to that, if you're attached to the belief that you can't do something because you've always been told that or because you're just like your father or you inherited that from your mother, you hear family saying this over and over again, oh, he got that from his grandfather and oh, he got this from his great-grandmother and, and, and all of that. That's nonsense. You, you are what you choose to be, not what you inherit. And you've got to know in your soul that you have the capacity to be anything that you want, that you are a purposeful, divine creature, and that you can create anything you want for yourself in your life. And the first thing you have to do is get rid of all of those self-defeating I'ms. I'm old. I'm tired. I can't help it. I always tell people, look, don't let an old person move into your body. It's your body. You can do anything you want with it. And if you start walking slow and if you start stooping yourself over and you start uh, minimizing your energy levels and, and sitting around a lot and feeling sorry for yourself and, and watching the world go by, before long, you're going to be uh, immobilized throughout your entire life. Don't let that old person move in. Keep yourself young and vibrant. Not, not youthful necessarily. I mean, be, be grateful for whatever age that you are. But don't take on those, those habits that are going to keep you from being able to do anything you want. There's no age out there. I mean, I watch Norman Vincent Peale get up in front of an audience, and he's in his mid-90s. And he's got more energy than some people I know in their, in their 20s and 30s. And it's an attitude. It's a belief. This is a man who was the, one of the pioneers of the uh, positive thinking movement. And his whole life has been a testament to that. And I've seen it over and over again. And I also see people who are exactly the opposite. You don't have to be tiredness is a, is a is a choice. Fatigue is a choice. You don't get tired when you have something pleasant to do. Your life is working when you're inspired, and being inspired means to think inspirational thoughts about yourself. major, major, major category of erroneous zones, one that uh, immobilizes people all over the world, is this whole business of guilt and worry. I'm guilty. Let's start with guilt. People use guilt all the time. It's amazing. It doesn't matter where you go. We were in uh, Jamaica just, uh, just a few weeks ago, my wife and all of the children. We have seven children. And we were going through the various markets, and there was this older woman there who had one tooth and uh, she didn't look like she was very healthy, and uh, we walked, sort of walked past her uh, tent and didn't walk in. And the woman said, come into my tent, come into my tent, and we just sort of kept walking because there's a hundred tents there. Finally, she started yelling at us, nobody likes me. Nobody wants to come into my tent. You don't like me at all. Nobody likes me. My children don't like me. Nobody. <laughs> sure enough, my wife turned around and said, maybe we should go in that tent. <laughs> Guilt is very effective at getting people to uh, conform and to do what you want them to do. What is guilt? Guilt is the immobilization that comes from living in the past. It is about, you can't be guilty about things that you're going to do. Right? Your guilt is about things in the past. 
and let's distinguish right here that there's there's something called learning from the past, which is very valuable and very important. And there's nothing in the world wrong with it. You do something, you behave towards someone in a way that you don't like, you've done something that is inappropriate, you've made a mistake, you've, uh, you've dropped the ball in some way, and what you say to yourself, instead of, oh, I'm so terrible and I'm so awful and I'm just such a bad person, which is instantly putting a label on yourself and immobilizing you and keeping you from growing and learning from it, what you can say instead is, I am going to work even harder in this day at not behaving in those ways. And these are the things that I'm going to do. But most people don't do that. Instead, they accept guilt. And the guilt that they accept is, I am not worthy. And this is the reason that they uh, adopt this kind of a strategy is because they've been taught this since the time that they were little boys and little girls. We get children to do things by making them feel guilty. Oh, all right. You don't have to carry the chairs upstairs. I'll carry them with my bad back. You just sit there and enjoy yourself Why? I'll carry all of these card table chairs on my back. And it doesn't matter. Don't worry about me. I'm just your mother. And I, if I fall down, and it's like instantly you're up and you've got this whole vision of her falling down the stairs and card table chairs all over her and so on. And, and it works. And the, and the schools use it. And the the churches use it. They're, they're famous for it. And parents use it. And, and businesses use it. Institutions use it. And you see people susceptible to it all the time. You can get somebody to tip a little more by just giving them a look to make them feel guilty. Uh, you, can, you can literally uh, make anybody do anything that you want through guilt. And guilt is a trap. And it's a useless emotion. Because being immobilized now about something that has already happened is, when you think about it, a pretty silly and wasteful thing to do. The now is here. Everything that happened in your life happened. You can never should have done it. You can never would have done it. You can never could have done it any differently than it happened. And knowing that, knowing that all of the things that you've done in your life are over, then if they're over in the physical reality, then in your mind is the only place that you have anything left over since the physical reality is just now, now is all there is and all there ever is. It's the working unit of your life. So everything that has transpired in the past, since it's over, the only thing that's left over is how you're choosing to process it. If you process it in a way that makes you feel guilty, then that will immobilize you. That will make your life unhappy. That will keep you from being fulfilled in the present moments of your life. So what you want to do, instead of processing events and things that you've done, that you've chosen to feel guilty over is to say, instead, I'm going to shift that to how can I learn from these? What do I, what was, what's the lesson in this? What did I have to learn? I have a belief that life gives exams. And if you don't pass the exams, you just keep repeating them over and over and over again. And a lot of people use this guilt trip. Uh, their whole life becomes this enormous trip of, uh, of guilt. Uh, always feeling bad about what they've done and why they did it, always putting themselves down and finding fault with who they are, always rejecting themselves because they didn't perform to somebody else's expectations or they didn't do things the way they they were supposed to do them and so on. So guilt plays a big role in people's lives. It plays a, a, a role in our culture. We are all very susceptible to it. Okay, I'd like to just review a couple of strategies here for um, getting rid of guilt. First is to begin to view the past as something that can never be changed. That's very important. It's over. And your feeling guilty isn't going to change the past, nor will it make me a better person. Now, if you were in a society or in a culture in which by feeling bad about what happened in the past, it would change it, I would be here making a tape in favor of guilt. Like if right now you could feel guilty about the outcome of the Peloponnesian War and how terrible the outcome was and how awful the Athenians were treated and so on. And then if I said to you, well, will that change the outcome of the war? You would say, well, of course not. It's over. Well, this morning is just as over as the Peloponnesian War. And your feeling guilty about what happened this morning is just, in terms of changing what happened, is just, makes just as much sense as feeling guilty about the outcome of the Peloponnesian War. It isn't going to change the outcome at all. So instead of being focused on things that are not going to change the outcome, what you want to do is be focused on how you can, in fact, change the outcome in the future. 
and guilt keeps you from changing the outcome in the future. That's what you have to understand about guilt. Guilt, like everything else in your life, transpires now, in this moment. This is when it's happening. And instead of, if you, if you can look at and process it this way and say, instead of feeling guilty in this moment, what could I be doing otherwise? And that's the big payoff for guilt. Guilt keeps you from doing something about it. That's why I call it a useless emotion, because it, it keeps you hung up on the past in the present, which is all you have. And if you use up your present to be hung up on the past, then you can't use your present to do something constructive now. So it's a very useful technique emotionally for people to employ to keep themselves from taking risks, from trying new things, from moving on in their life. You should ask yourself what you're avoiding in the present. And, and ask that question, instead of feeling guilty right now, what could I be doing? And then begin to accept certain things about yourself as, as who you are. And then if your parents or your boss or your spouse or somebody doesn't like something that you've done or whatever, instead of feeling guilty about it, you say, this is who I am. These are the choices that I make. Yes, I'm a person who dresses this way. And if somebody else doesn't like it, like if it's a, a relative or whatever and they don't like it, this is still who I am. And even though I'm not going to rub it in anybody else's face, I am not going to choose guilt when they respond negatively to who I am, to how I dress, to what I say, to the language that I use, to the people that I go out with, to the car that I drive, to the job that I have, to whatever it is. It's endless. There's always going to be people out there who aren't going to, but who aren't going to like it. But if you feel guilty about that, then you're giving them control of your life. And the only reason people use guilt to to uh, in your life is just like the woman in Jamaica. The only reason that she's out there doing that every day, practicing her little routine, is because it gets people into her hut, into her tent. And that's the very same thing. People are trying to get you into their tent. They're trying to get you to live the life that they believe you should be living. And as long as you are willing to do that, then guilt is the thing that will get them to uh, to use. You've got to begin to teach people in your life who use guilt on you, that it is no longer something that is going to work. Now, how do you do that? You don't do it with a lot of arguments. You don't do it with a lot of talk. You teach people with behavior, not with words. What you are speaks so loud, I can't hear what you say. So what you do is you let people know as they start using guilt on you that it isn't going to do any good at all that you're still going to dress the way you want to, you're still going to be with the people that you want. And you can simply say things like, I understand that you don't approve of that. I understand you don't like that. This is who I am. This is what I've chosen. And begin to see that you, you start to feel good about that. It, may, it is something that makes you feel strong. And you begin, and you know, you, people always like strength, not weakness. And, and that's true about ourselves as well. We like ourselves when we're strong, when we resist an addiction, when we resist doing something that we know is, uh, is self-defeating, when we stand up to someone that is difficult for us to stand up to, even though it may be painful at the moment, we like ourselves better when we do that. And that's what you have to do. You have to teach people who use guilt on you that it no longer applies in your life. Now, the opposite of these useless emotions is worry. And the reason I say opposite is because worry is using up the present moment to be immobilized about something that's going to happen. You don't worry about the past. You feel guilty about the past. Guilt is about the past in the present. Worry is about the future in the present. Remember, everything is experienced now in the present moment. And again, the payoff for worry is, what could I be doing in this moment if I weren't worrying? And then you say, well, my worry is keeping me from doing these things, taking this action, changing this behavior, moving on in a new direction, getting out of that relationship, whatever. Now, people worry about everything. People worry about their health. People worry about their children. They worry about dying. They worry about their job and the economy and having a heart attack and security and everybody else's happiness. And am I doing the right thing? And the prices and whether we're gonna, the economy is going to collapse and accidents and what if I have one and what do other people think about me and, and my weight and my money and my car breaking down and my bills and my parents may be getting sick or getting into heaven or, or what if there's no God or the weather or getting old or flying or my daughter's virginity or talking in front of groups or going into the city and even the most neurotic of all is 
worrying about having nothing to worry about, which I've had people do. <laughs> I don't have anything to worry about, but then that's what worries me because I just know that when I don't have anything to worry about, then something's going to go bad, and pff, there they go off again. Now, here's the greatest piece of advice that any human being could ever receive. I know that sounds a little bit on the conceited side, but it is the most important advice that you could ever get about worry. Listen carefully. It makes no sense to worry about the things that you have no control over because if you have no control over them, it makes no sense to worry about them, right? If you have no control over something, getting older or dying or getting into heaven or whatever it may be, then worrying about it isn't going to do you any good. So it makes no sense to worry about the things you have no control over because if you have no control over them, it makes no sense to worry about them. And it makes no sense to worry about the things that you do have control over because if you've got control over them, it makes no sense to worry about them. And there goes everything you could ever worry about in your life. If you don't have control, you relax and you flow and you let it go. You just let it go. Worrying about something you have no control over makes absolutely no sense. And if you do have control over it, then take control. Whatever it is that you want to do, if you're afraid of flying in an airplane, you have control over that. You, there are trains available, there are cars available, there are courses and ways to go about learning uh, how to eliminate your fear of uh, flying, and so on. So you can either do something about it, or you can choose not to do something about it. And either way, it isn't going to make any difference in your life if you choose to worry. It just doesn't help anything. So once you learn that, you can, you can begin to, to, to assess this whole business of why you would choose guilt or worry in your life. And again, you look back over and over and over again at it and you dissect it and you tear it all apart and you go to your analyst and you, and you spend a thousand years in therapy and you find out that everything that you experience in your life, you experience in the present moment, the working unit of your life, and you experience it in the now for a reason. If you choose guilt or if you choose worry, you, you cannot be active and creative and fulfilled and changing and doing all kinds of good and exciting things for yourself in your life now if you are occupying your now with worry and guilt. And if you think that worry is something that you just inherited or it's something that your parents passed on to you uh, and, and it's something that you just can't do anything about, begin to practice. Do things like I always tell people, just worry. Just sit there. I used to tell my uh, patients over and over again, just sit there and worry. Show me what you're doing when you're worrying. And you begin to see how silly it is. It's just a, it's just a mental exercise that is all caught up in, uh, in, in this silliness. And all the things that you ever worry about. There's a wonderful old saying that says, I'm an old man and I've had many troubles, most of which have never happened. And the most of which have never happened is all the worries. You get all these worries and you see them coming at you and you go, oh my goodness, what I'm gonna, what's going to happen? I'm going to get audited by the IRS. I remember the first time I ever got audited by the IRS and I talked about it and I was playing this same silly game, worrying about it and what it, and then I went through the, and it was a very pleasant experience. And I actually ended up getting a little bit more money, a little more of a refund. All of this concern, all of this time, all of this energy over something that wasn't, and I've, it's happened to me many times. I've been through that, that process, and I've, I don't worry about those things anymore. Now I have people in my life who handle those things, and I don't occupy my mind with that. And I do the same thing with my children, and I have seven beautiful children. And I watch them grow up, and I know that there's all kinds of pitfalls and things out there that can happen. But I can't, keep, I can't keep my eye on every one of my children all day long when they're in school or when they're in their jobs or when they're in their relationships or whatever. I simply can't do that. So I have the choice. Am I going to stay, uh, st sit around all day long and worry about each one of those children and whether or not they're going to be uh, in any danger? Or am I going to just raise them to be uh, as careful and uh, productive as they possibly can and know that I can't do anything about that? And this isn't to say that I'm unconcerned. It is to say that I refuse to use my life, filling it up with worry over things that I can't do anything about. I just can't go that way. And you don't have to either. Just like guilt has the the notion that there's a difference between guilt and learning from the past. You do something, and instead of feeling guilty about it, you learn from it. Uh, worry is, uh, is one thing, and preparing yourself for the future is something quite different. Uh, but again, preparing yourself or planning for the future is still something that takes place in the now. 
So what you want to learn to do is to enjoy it in the now instead of trying to live it two months from now or three months from now. Enjoy the planning process. If you're going to have a vacation uh, three months from now, uh, that's a very enjoyable process. All of that planning and all of the activity that goes into it and all the expectations and then the anticipation of what that's going to be like, that's one of the most joyful things about a vacation. Uh, all of that planning part. That isn't worry. Worry is when you are immobilized. The key word to define an erroneous zone is, does it immobilize me in the present? And if the answer is yes, then it's something I want to get rid of. Another erroneous zone that keeps a lot of people immobilized and from moving to higher levels in their life is uh, what I call fear of the unknown, an absence of openness, a, uh, a prejudice towards uh, never changing, towards staying only with the familiar, towards looking for security as a way of life rather than uh, moving on to uh, new and vital areas to explore. Einstein said the most beautiful thing in all the world is the most mysterious. And yet so many people are afraid to uh, break the barriers of convention and uh, wander into the unknown and try new and exciting things for themselves. They stay only with what they've always known and what they've always done in their life. There's a wonderful Zen saying that says, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And the teacher can be in any form. The teacher can be a, another human being. It can be a book. It can be a tape like this. It can be uh, anything at all that, uh, that might show up in your life. But if you're not ready, if you're still stuck, if you're still afraid to, to try new things and move into new territory, then, you're, uh, then it'll go right past you. I know so many things in my life that showed up in my 20s and my 30s that I wasn't ready for, and they were right there, books that I had on my shelf, and I've had there for 20 years, and I never even picked them up, and I picked them up and I said, wow, this is fantastic. I didn't know this guy knew that. And it's a book that's 6,000 years old. <laughs> it's been there, but I wasn't ready. So you have to develop a readiness. And what you have to do is learn how to get rid of the prejudices in your life. And the word prejudice means to prejudge. And I'm not talking just about the, what we think of as the, the typical prejudices, which are racial prejudices and things like that. But I'm talking about a, a, the, the willingness to prejudge life, to, uh, to tell yourself that these, uh, this is something that I wouldn't enjoy. This is something I couldn't do. This is, uh, this is an activity that just uh, wouldn't work for me. Uh, and then it keeps you from, uh, from trying all of these new and delicious and exciting new things. What I'm really advocating here is an openness to new experience. The more things that you're capable of doing, the more things that you're willing to do, the happier your life is going to be, the more fulfilled you're going to be, and the more you'll be fulfilling the purpose that you're here for in the first place. The fewer things that you can do, the fewer things that you're willing to try, the more rigid your life is, the less happy and the more immobilized you become. So people who can do a lot of things, who have a lot of options, who when they have a picnic are willing to go out and play a little softball, even if they aren't very good at it. They can even, instead of playing third base, maybe they can be third base. Right? Some people tag you on their way home. But they're at least willing to get out there and, and try it and do something versus the person who sits around and tells themselves that this is just something I can't do. Now, if this doesn't immobilize you and doesn't bother you, then it's not an erroneous zone. But it almost always does. It's a very restrictive kind of thing. So opening yourself up to, these, to, uh, to being able to do and try anything is an exciting way to live your life. There's a thing called security that a lot of people use to keep themselves tied into the uh, known and the familiar. And they really have this belief that, uh, that there's security, that uh, if you do things a certain way and follow the rules that have been prescribed for you and laid down for you from the time that you were a little child... Uh, that you'll have security if you save a certain amount of your money and if you go to work a lot and you do. And the fact is that there is no such thing as security. There's only one kind of security in the world, and that's inner security. Most people are looking for their security in things outside of themselves. They're other-directed rather than inner-directed. The inner-directed person is a, is a person who, uh, who understands that uh, my secure feelings are just thoughts, and they come from how I feel about myself and that the physical world doesn't offer any security at all. I mean, we are born into it, and we're here for a short time, and then we die. And when we die and how we die is something that uh, each one of us uh, thinks about and it gets concerned about, and what happens to us after we die. There's no security out there. None of, us, none of us know how much time that we have. 
the future is is a, is a thought. The future is always the future, and it's just a thought. It's just a, it's just a whimsical kind of invisible, dimensionless, formless, amorphous kind of uh, thing inside of our uh, consciousness, that uh, that determines whether or not we're secure or insecure. You're not going to get security from having money or from having uh, a lot of uh, power. Or, I mean, if, if power comes from being able to uh, control others, what happens when the others disappear? Your power is gone. If security comes from f- from being glamorous and beautiful and, and exciting, where is, where is your security when the glamour leaves? And it, it, and it leaves all of us. If, 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 if it comes from being able to dominate someone else, if, sec- if that's what makes you secure, what, w- what happens when those people leave? Your, your security is gone. You see... Security is something that you can never get. It's an illusion. And once you know that, then you begin to, to wander through life uh, and explore the unknown and not be looking for the safe haven. There's a wonderful poem by James Cavanaugh, who's a dear, dear friend of mine, uh, one of the finest poets in the country. It's called uh, Someday. And he says, Someday I'll walk away and be free and leave the sterile ones their secure sterility. I'll leave without a forwarding address and walk across some barren wilderness to drop the world there, then wander free of care like an unemployed atlas. It's a nice image, isn't it? Just to, to be able to wander. I remember reading one of my favorite books ever by one of the, my favorite authors, John Steinbeck. And in, in his mid-60s, he took off across the country with a dog named Charlie. And he wrote a book about, about it called Travels with Charlie. Just him and his dog. And he just took off and went through all the different uh, byways and the little highways of, uh, of, of America and wrote his observations on what he was seeing. And almost everyone I ever share that story with and, or have them read ta- Travels with Charlie, they always come back and say, I'd like to do that. That's really exciting. Yet so many people don't do that. They get hung up on their secure sterility. Or they have this whole notion of perfectionism. And Churchill had a wonderful uh, quotation. He said, the maxim that nothing avails but perfection may be spelled paralysis. Because if you believe that things have to be perfect and you have to do things in a certain way and you can't do them any other way, then you become paralyzed. If you believe in, in perfection and that it, uh, it, it, it can never be perfect, then you're going to be paralyzed all your life. You want to transcend that. You want to go past that need for perfection and just live. Some of the ways that this fear of the unknown behavior show up in your life might surprise you. It isn't, uh, it isn't just in your work or uh, the, the kinds of occupational things that occupy your mind. It is, uh, it's in all areas of your life. You see people who uh, will eat the same kinds of foods and won't ever go to another kind of restaurant, and they'll, eat their, they'll always have their meat done a certain way, and they will never try. Uh, I, I, I was shocked at my grandmother, who was in her 90s, and she had never had Chinese food. In her 90s. I, I couldn't believe that. And I said, Grandma, you mean to tell me? What well, she said, I just, I just never, it always looked kind of funny to me. And I never, I never tried it. And I thought, as, as much as I loved her, I thought, what a, what a strange thing for her to go through her whole life. She had also never had spaghetti in, uh, in 90 years. Never ate spaghetti. <laughs> it was a, uh, and uh, when you went to my grandmother's house, the food was always cooked in a certain way. And, uh, and it was fine. It, was, it, it wasn't immobilizing to her. But for me, that would be something that uh, I would feel very limited by. I, would, I want to try it all. I want to try kibbe, and I want to try raw fish, and, uh, uh, and I want to try Japanese and Chinese food and Lebanese food and, uh, and you name it. Uh, and and it, again, it broadens your, your perspective. It, it, it uh, makes your life more exquisite and more beautiful and more, more loving and more, more happy. Uh, Wearing the same kind of uh, clothes, some people uh, can't, uh, won't try anything that's just a little bit. But oh, that's not me. I can't, we- I can't wear anything that isn't uh, exactly the mode that I've been told that I'm supposed to fit in. Uh, and I say to people, give it a try. You know, wear wear something that you've never worn before. It, uh, it, it's a wonderful feeling to know that you you're capable of uh, of of doing it, even if it isn't. Uh, uh, I came home one day with my little children, my five-year-old or whatever, and I had on a pair of uh, strange madras shorts and a, and a funny little uh, shirt that hung over my back and it didn't button up the way it was supposed to. And I walked in, and my five-year-old daughter said, Where did you get those weird clothes? <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's kind of nice. She gets to see Daddy uh, do something a little bit different now and then.
Some people read the same magazines and the same newspapers for their whole lifetime and the same political opinions. They hear them over and over endlessly and never think to themselves about maybe reading the opposite point of view. As a matter of fact, they've done studies on this where they'll follow a person's eyes when they're reading an editorial. They'll look, and as they get to the point in the editorial where everything agrees with them, their eyes keep reading. And then they come to a point where right in the middle of the editorial, they will, in the experimenters inje- interjected a uh, contrary opinion, and their eyes shifted to another part of the page. It's like a, it's like a consciousness, uh, a subconscious kind of uh, shifting I won't let in any opinion that doesn't conform to what I believe. And that's very stereotypical, and it's very prejudiced, and it's very limiting and rigid, uh, and, it, uh, and it keeps you from being able to expand in your life. You might see only the same kind of movies all your life. You might live in only the same neighborhood, in the same place, in the same uh, area, and never take a chance. Maybe a job opportunity comes along in another part of the country or or maybe overseas, and instead of saying, yeah, you know, we'll try that. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not sure, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. And it's interesting. uh, uh, Most people go through their whole lives and don't take these opportunities, and then they get very close to death. Something will happen. They might have a heart attack, or they might have an accident of some kind, and they almost stare death right in the face. And when they come out of those experiences, almost always they realize that, keeping themselves trapped in the, uh, in the known isn't what they want to do any longer. And they, all of a sudden, they're willing to take the risks. And you shouldn't have to wait till some tragedy befalls you or till you get to a point where you're almost physically uh, incapacitated before you're willing to try these things, before you can get on an airplane and fly off to India and see what that country is like or, uh, or take that job in, in another part of the world or, or live temporarily out of a, out of a suitcase and a trailer or whatever. Or get in your uh, get in your van or your your motor vehicle and uh, and go across the country and and see it uh, instead of just uh, thinking about it and wishing uh, that that you had that opportunity. You have to create those, and when you do create those, you're inspired. And when you're inspired, your life is working in all areas. Your life is working. You can refuse to listen to the ideas of people. You hear people over and over again who are afraid of the unknown will only invite certain kinds of people to their homes. And they say, no, we don't want to invite them because they, they don't think like we do. <laughs> they don't have the same opinion or they have a different religion. To me, I want, I want a mixture around. I want to see, you know, if uh, get, get me some uh, people with contrary opinions, whether they're religious or political or controversial or whatever it may be, that's terrific because the more you shy away from those opinions and those attitudes and those beliefs of other people, the more prejudiced you are. If you don't know and experience what somebody is like from another culture, then you are prejudging them. If you prejudge them, you have a prejudice, and that's what, that is very limiting to you. You might be afraid to try new activities as a uh, way of uh, staying with the unknown. Um, you might avoid uh, anyone that you label as deviant. Uh, you know, we, we put these uh, very negative labels on people. Uh, they're weirdos, they're, they're, they're kooks, they're commies, they're fags, they're wops, they're, they're hippies, they're kikes, they're niggers, they're gooks, you, you name it. Some kind of negative epithet, some kind of... And then the, way, the reason that we do that is because we're afraid of the, uh, afraid of the uh, unknown. We don't, we don't know who these people are like. We don't know what their lifestyle might be or... And, and instead of being open to it and introducing ourselves to uh, something new and perhaps uh, expanding ourselves, instead we just place these labels on these people and then keep them out of our lives forever. And it's a way of avoiding the unknown. And, uh, the, you know, there are some people who take vacations in the same place every year for, for 50 years. There's an old saying that there's some people live 90 years and some people live one year 90 times. And what you want to do is not be a person who lives one year 90 times. You want to change some of those kinds of things. Uh, you want to look at uh, selectively uh, uh, opening yourself up to as many new opportunities as you po- possibly can. Begin to take risks in your life. Risk-taking is a very important thing, not throwing your body in front of a moving train or anything like that where you jeopardize your health, but uh, a risk might be uh, going uh, on a job interview. It might be confronting somebody. It might be uh, getting in your car and not having a plan, not, not knowing where you're going. It's like instead of being externally directed, you become internally directed. Uh, You begin to ask yourself, what is it that I would like to experience in my life? What kind of strengths would I like to exhibit? And then 
take those risks and try those new things. And, and a word needs to be said here about failure. You have to understand that you don't fail at anything in life. You can't fail at anything. That's really an important notion. Everything you do produces a result. If you take a golf ball and put it up on a golf tee and you swing at it and it dribbles off to the side, you haven't failed. You've produced a result. The question isn't whether you're willing to fail or not or what you do or, or whether or not you're a failure. The question is what do you do with the results that you produce in your life. If you weigh 300 pounds and you want to weigh 125 pounds, you haven't failed. You've produced massive results. The question is, what do you do with the results that you have produced? Do you tell yourself that, oh, I'm no good at this, and you put a label on yourself and stay away from the unknown? Or do you make an effort to learn from what you've produced? Everybody who has any kind of an addiction of any kind, whether it's alcohol or drugs or uh, uh, food or or whatever it may be understands that if you're going to get over the addiction the fact is that you have to wander into unknown territory you have to leave that behavior behind you and you can get support groups and you can get into uh, every kind of organization and you can uh, have uh, detox uh, programs and you can do a thousand different things but the bottom line on changing behavior is that you have to make the decision to change it. No one else can do it for you. You have to wander into unknown territory. If you've been drinking every single day of your life for the last 15 years, that is the known. And you perhaps are very much afraid of the unknown. What would it be like to go through a day without having a drink? How would it, what would it be like to have a meal without having to have to drink something? Or what would it be like to not use cocaine uh, today? Or what would it be like? And, you, and instead of taking the chance and wandering into the, uh, into the unknown in a whole new area, you go back with the familiar. You stay, that is, those who, are, who have addictions. And whether it's coffee or whether it's food or, 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 or anything else, it is still a fear of moving into a new territory. And the fact is that the fear is all in your mind. It's only a thought, a new and healthy and fulfilling and exciting and exquisite life is only a thought away. You change around the expectation that this is going to be tough or that I can't do this and instead shift it to I can do anything, I can be anything, I can experience anything one meal at a time, one day at a time, and I can make anything happen for myself. And that's how you change behavior, by wandering into the unknown rather than staying with the familiar. And when the student is ready, when you are ready, you will find help and guidance available to you all over the place. And when you're not ready, that help and guidance that is always there will always seem to be missing from your life. It's just a question of readiness. All right, we have a few more erroneous zones that it's important to cover here as we move towards the end of this tape. One of them I call in the, in the book uh, the justice trap. That is uh, demanding for yourself that uh, life be fair being upset when it isn't, being upset when other people make more money than you do, comparing yourself continuously to other people, uh, finding fault with others, cultivating, instead of cultivating your own garden, as Voltaire told us to do in Candide, cultivate your own garden, you're busy cultivating everybody else's garden. If somebody else wants to grow rutabagas and you want to grow cucumbers, then grow your cucumbers and keep your nose out of other people's gardens, and you'll find yourself a lot happier. So don't be looking for fairness or justice or everything being exactly equal. If you want to get ahead in life and make your life all that you know you can make of it, then you've got to simply say to yourself, why am I choosing not to do that? Anything that you can visualize, anything that you can get into your mind or your consciousness and visualize and image for yourself, you have the capacity to bring into the world. The ancestor to every single action in your life is a thought. A thought. Thoughts first, then action. You can't have an action without a thought preceding it. So the question is, what kind of thoughts do I have? Do I have thoughts that go around saying, oh, that the world is just a bad place? If that's what you believe, then that's what will expand for you. If you believe that the world is a terrible place and it's filled with all kinds of corruption and it's filled with criminals and it's filled with the uh, precariousness and so on, then that will be your experience because that's what you carry around in your mind. What you think about expands. As you think, so shall you be, right? From Proverbs. It's the most important words in there. And if that's what your thoughts are and you're demanding justice for yourself by comparing yourself to others, 
and looking for reasons to be unhappy, if you argue for your limitations, you're going to get your limitations. If you argue for your happiness, you're going to get your happiness. Now, one of the things that you want to avoid is one of the erroneous zones I call procrastination, which is simply hoping and wishing and filling yourself with maybes and uh, being bored and, uh, and all of these kinds of things. If you sit around and hope and wish and say maybe over and over and over again in your life, then you are simply going to be a person who is using up the present moment to fill it with wishes rather than with action. Procrastination is nothing more than a typical way to keep yourself from taking action in your life. And I have found, we just uh, moved into a new home not too long ago, and we had uh, about uh, 200 boxes that had to be broken up in the garage. And I looked at those boxes, and I knew that nobody else was going to break them up. But Daddy, this is Daddy's job. And uh, I, every day I'd go in and I'd look at all of those boxes and I'd say, no, I really don't want to deal with that today, and I'd let that go. And then came the time when I, uh, just a few days ago, when I went out there and I said, I'm just going to break up five. I'll just do five. And then I'll do, if I do five every day for the next three weeks, I'll have them all broken up and then I'll call the moving and they'll come and pick them up. Well, that's the key to eliminating procrastination because as soon as I did five, I said, well, I can do five more. And I came in about an hour and a half later and I had the entire job done. I have found that to be true with virtually everything in my life. If I, I can put it off and put it off and put it off, but just do one sentence and you got your letter written. You know, just sit down and instead of telling yourself, I've got to write this long, long letter to my mother that I, and I haven't written in a long time, you don't do that. You say, I think I'll just write one paragraph to her today. And then all of a sudden, the whole thing is done. You know, just, just one little action, one little step, and you have, it, you have the whole thing corrected. In Hamlet, there's a line that says, Refrain tonight, and that shall lend a kind of easiness to the next abstinence, and the next more easy, for use almost can change the stamp of nature. That's so beautiful. For use almost can change the stamp of nature. You can change your very nature by just refraining, by just doing something in the moment. So whatever it is right now, as soon as this tape is over, and it'll be over in just a few minutes, as soon as it's over... Whatever it is that you've been procrastinating about or thinking about doing but haven't gotten around to do it, just do an opening on it. Just start it, and you'll find that that simple little act is what gets you going. And it's always, and, and where does that come from? It doesn't come from acting. It comes from thinking. Thinking makes it so. So rid your life of hoping and wishing and uh, and saying maybe and, and all of those kinds of things and instead move beyond that and say anything I can visualize in my mind if I can get it there and hold it there I can act upon it so I will act upon it in the now in the working unit of your life now today this moment anger is another erroneous zone that is very important to deal with it's something that uh that I think a lot about because there's so much of it in the world. It's the cause of uh, almost all international crises. It's the cause of family breakups and so on. And a lot of people think that anger is just something that happens. And anger isn't. You don't have anger genes. You have choices. There's no anger in the world. There are only people thinking angry thoughts and then acting out on those thoughts. Buddha said you will not be punished for your anger. You will be punished by your anger. Your anger is something that you live with. And when you use it on somebody else or abuse somebody else with that anger and act out on it, you are carrying around the seeds of your own destruction and the destruction of others. You must know that it starts with your processing. You see an event in the world take place. You see your children do something that you don't want them to do. Someone cuts you off on the freeway or whatever and... It isn't the act that makes you angry. It's how you process the act. Always keep in mind that if you didn't know about it, then it couldn't upset you. It couldn't make you angry. So it, it, the fact is it's your knowing. Somehow your knowing is connected to your anger, and that knowing is your processing of it. I mean, your children could all day long be failing biology and be skipping school and everything else, and if you don't know about it, you can't get angry. Now someone tells you about it, and you're angry. The event didn't cause you to be angry. If the event caused you to be angry then you would have been angry long before you knew about it because they've been doing this for six months. It is your processing of it. And what you have to do is learn that 
how whatever you're experiencing, whether it's anger or any of the erroneous sounds that I've been speaking about in here, and guilt and worry and self-rejection and approval-seeking and justice and procrastination, all of these things are to be considered by you as your way of processing your world. You have the choice not to be angry in a given moment. I don't care what your nationality is. I don't care what your background is. It doesn't make any difference what kind of excuse you use for hanging on to these things. If they are, if they are something that is immobilizing you, then you have to leave it. And you leave it by, first of all, changing around your thoughts. The final erroneous zone is, is growing up. <laughs> Independence, if you will. Leaving the nest. Getting past that whole business of believing that you have to be in somebody else's life that no longer works for you, that you have to be stuck uh, being dependent upon someone else. Remember, your children are not your children. They are the products of life's longing for itself. They come through you, not for you. And while I strongly believe in interdependent relationships, you still have to leave the nest. You still have to. And there are many adults who never get a chance to leave the nest. They're always seeking permission. They're always asking permission of life or somebody else in it in order to make their lives happy. I'd like to conclude this tape, this labor of, uh, of love on something that I did many, many years ago. And I realized that in going through it how, uh, how important all of this information still is. And there was a wonderful quote that I quoted uh, in the last page of Erroneous Sounds. And it came from a Reader's Digest piece back in 1974 called The One Sure Way to Happiness by June Callwood. And she says it this way. I couldn't say it any better. She said, Nothing on earth renders happiness less approachable than trying to find it. Historian Will Durant described how he looked for happiness in knowledge and found only disillusionment. He then sought happiness in travel and found weariness, in wealth and found discord and worry. He looked for happiness in his writing and was only fatigued. One day he saw a woman waiting in a tiny car with a sleeping child in her arms. A man descended from a train and came over and gently kissed the woman and then the baby, very softly so as not to awaken him. The family drove off and left her aunt with a stunning realization of the real nature of happiness. He relaxed and discovered that every normal function of life holds some delight. And that's the end of that quote. That is such a powerful message that every normal function of your life